Welcome to SMA's Southern Medicine Podcast. Practicing medicine in the southeastern United States presents unique challenges for healthcare professionals. The South's heavily rural population and limited resources require medical professionals to be more resourceful in their approach to providing quality care. SMA's Southern Medicine Podcast addresses these issues by drawing on the experience of healthcare leaders who provide a multi-specialty, interdisciplinary team approach to medicine for the purpose of providing better care for the Southern patient population. Welcome to the Southern Medical Association's Southern Medicine Podcast. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Julie Rios join us. Dr. Rios is an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She is experienced in all areas of infertility and gynecologic surgery. Her clinical and research interests focus on polycystic ovary syndrome, implantation, and oncofertility. Welcome, Dr. Rios. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm uh, here to talk about oncofertility and what that means for our patients. I would like to begin with my first question, which is, what is oncofertility? I think that's a great question. So oncofertility came out of the theory that life after cancer or um, gonadotoxic treatments, which mean treatments that are toxic to the ovaries and or uterus, need to be considered in patients getting these therapies. And so the idea is if we can see these patients before they start treatments, and at least talk to them about their risk of infertility and risk of issues with their ovaries, that there also might be ways that we can preserve fertility before they start chemo and or even potentially after they complete their treatment um, if there's not time to do it beforehand. What is the role of the primary obstetrician gynecologist in oncofertility? I think a lot of times the primary OBGYN has the role of potentially diagnosing some of the cancers that are seen. In particular, we see a lot of gynecology malignancies as well as breast malignancies within the OBGYN community. And a lot of times it's the OB that's making that referral on to the GYN oncologist or the breast surgeon for further evaluation. I think at that point, it's worth a discussion of you may have treatments that are gonna affect your fertility. Would you like to see a reproductive specialist to talk about options for fertility preservation, or at least understand those risks. What options do women have for fertility preservation today? So there's two main options. Um, one talks about, uh, or is egg freezing or oocyte cryopreservation. And if the patient is married or with a long-term partner or wants to use some kind of donor sperm, they could also do embryo freezing. Uh, this process takes about two weeks, so that's why you know, having primary providers who are making the diagnosis of cancer, getting them to the reproductive endocrinologist fast allows us to have that two week time frame to freeze eggs and or embryos, depending on the patient's situation. The other option is something that's experimental. It's called ovarian tissue cryopreservation. This doesn't need as much time. It involves a laparoscopy surgery where a full or partial ovary is removed. That tissue is then um, cut into small tissue strips and frozen. And currently the research on this allows that tissue to be retransplanted back into the body and to allow for fertility. So this is a considered experimental in the fact that um, they can't prove that they're what the live birth rate or what the fertility preservation rate is with this procedure. However, in patients that won't have the time to do egg freezing, this is another option and there's not a ton of centers that do this across the country. So in patients that maybe this is an interest, you know, there are facilities that do take patients just to come and get this procedure done. And that is the case here at the University of Cincinnati and at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. How does gynecologic care change after cancer treatments? And so that's an excellent question. And so a lot of patients uh, or a good portion of them may have ovarian dysfunction after chemotherapy, especially if their treatments were high risk to the ovary. And so things like hyperestrogen, hypoestrogenemia, where they're not making enough estrogen, so they need that for bone protection, as well as heart protection and um, overall health. So hormone replacement therapy in women that are diagnosed with primary ovarian 
insufficiency after their treatment is something important to consider when we're seeing these patients. Plus, there's a lot of sexual dysfunction that can occur in cancer survivors. And so asking about that and understanding what are the reasons why patients aren't having a healthy sexual life, uh, including um, are they having pain with intercourse because of low estrogen and vaginal dryness? Are they having um, low libido where they just ha don't have any issue, uh, desire to have sex or they can't orgasm? Those are all issues that can occur in survivors. Um, also in patients that receive bone marrow transplant, there can also be a occurrence of graft versus host skin disease that can commonly first manifest in the vulvovaginal area. So being aware of what those changes look like and understanding screening those patients um, if they would come into your office for graft versus host disease. Why is this such an important topic? I think because we want to just get the word out there that oncofertility is an important area for patients getting gonadotoxic treatment. And we talk a lot about cancer patients, but there are medical diseases like lupus and um, other autoimmune disorders that get chemotherapy. And patients' biggest survivorship complaint is that their providers never offered or talked to them about fertility preservation. And you know, the patients have a lot on their plate when they get diagnosed with cancer and other diseases where they're gonna potentially get these gonadotoxic treatments. And so this just a pro provides more global awareness of what's out there, what can be offered to patients and making sure they're hearing it. I think if they hear it from multiple providers during this cancer or you know, medical disease journey, then they are understanding what their risk is, they're understanding what options they have. And so they're not as overwhelmed when they come and see the reproductive endocrinologist or they're not upset after they complete treatment and they said no one ever mentioned this to me. So that's why this is important and as providers for women's health, we need to take care of them in all stages of life and care and medical problems and things like that. Thank you again for joining us. To subscribe to additional SMA podcasts, please visit sma.org forward slash podcasts.